everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, Coded versus Codeless Testing Tools and the Space in Between. I'm Pam Morgan with Apple Tools, and I will be the session moderator. We are happy to be co-hosting this event today with our friends from Catalan. As people are joining, I would like to share a few tips to make the most of your webinar experience. First, this session is being recorded, and all participants, all registrants, will re receive an email with a link to the recording by the end of the next business day. Next, in the bottom right corner of this window, you should see an option to enable auto-generated captions. Feel free to toggle that as you see fit. At the bottom of your screen are icons for a variety of tools you can use during the webinar, including attendee chat and ask a question. Please post questions for the session speakers in the ask a question window and use the attendee chat window for general comments and dialogues. You can also use the reactions tools to show agreement, share some applause, celebrate comments and more. All of the engagement windows are resizable and movable by clicking on the tools in the top right corner. Feel free to resize or move the slides and media player windows to make the most of your desktop space. To return to the slides window or any other tool, simply click the icon on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can also refresh your browser window to return to the original configuration. Finally, should you encounter any technical issues, please click the help icon for tips and common resolutions. And now, let's get ready to begin. Welcome to Coded versus Coded, Coded versus Codeless Testing Tools and the Space in Between, presented by Apple Tools and Catalan. I'd like to introduce you today to our panelists. From Apple Tools, we have Anand Bagmar and Andrew Knight. Anand Bagmar is a software quality evangelist with more than 20 years in the software testing field. He's a contributor to the Selenium Project, has built a number of open source tools, and is passionate about shipping a quality product. Andrew Knight is the Automation Panda, an engineer, consultant, and international speaker who builds solutions for software testing problems. He's designed and built robust test automation projects for web apps, service APIs, and operating systems. And he's also the lead developer for BOA Constrictor, the .NET screenplay pattern. A little bit about Apple Tools. At Apple Tools, we're on a mission to help our customers deliver visually perfect digital experiences that delight customers from design through development and into deployment. Our products help them validate their digital experience at a lower cost with a breakthrough technology that we developed called Visual AI. Visual AI helps customers protect current application investments to ensure that future software projects deliver customer experiences that help compete and win in a digital world. And today from Catalan, we've got Mush Honda and Cody Rosenblath. Mush is a senior, in, senior engineering leader with more than 20 years of experience in quality engineering and agile software development. He has developed scalable test automation solutions to facilitate teams transition to an automation first quality engineering mindset. Cody Rosenblatt is a CTO at Catalan and has led engineering teams at startups, public and private companies, and industries ranging from financial services to augmented reality. At Catalan, Cody focuses on providing a comprehensive automation platform to support teams of all sizes. Catalan is a leading provider of end-to-end -end software quality platform with a flexible platform for web, API, mobile, and desktop testing that fits teams, projects of any size, and any purpose. Catalan is widely trusted by a global community across over 160 countries. Since their first launch in 2015, Catalan has experienced tremendous growth, serving <coughs> more than 100,000 companies of all shapes and sizes, many of them in the Fortune Global 500. Catalan is also recognized as a top edit automation tool by prestigious review sites. Okay, as I mentioned during today's live session, um, we are recording this. The panelists will also be taking one to two audience questions per topic. So as a reminder, please use the ask a question window to put your questions 
to pose your questions to the speakers and use the attendee chat window for general comments and dialogue. All right, let's get ready to dive into a lively discussion. Andy Knight's going to get us started. So Andy, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks, Pam, and hello everyone, and welcome. Glad to kick this off. So before we dive into our discussion, I would like to ask the audience a question. What kinds of test automation tools do you use right now? Are you using only coded tools, only codeless tools? Do you happen to be using both? Or have you not yet really done much automation and you're here to learn? I'm curious to know because this will help guide our discussion. Give everyone a, a minute or two. I've primarily used coded tools in my past. Do, 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 do. Let's see, about 37% of people have replied. If you haven't replied, please do so soon. Lots of answers in chat as well. More specific Ooh. answers in chat. <laughs> A lot of Cypress ginger, which I'm not familiar with, actually. Oh, yeah, people dropping it. Look at that. Yep. Right, we're at about 54% of attendees having responded. I'm seeing some familiar names, Selenium, UFT, Playwright. Oh, yeah, there we go. Woo. <laughs> Someone said the magic I think that word. Was just for, that was just for you, Andy. Right. Oh, yes. Selenium and Catalan. Cucumber, another magic word. Oh, yes. Test project. Nice. Okie dokie. Do a countdown here. 10, 9, 8, 7. Get your answers in. 6, <laughs> 5, 4, 3, Two, one. Oh, Python. All right. Let's release. Let's Harmony. see what happens. I don't know Harmony either. Boom. Wow. Okay. So it looks like that's a pretty good spread. That's interesting. So about a third of the folks have only used coded tools. A little more than a third of the folks have done coded and codeless. Um, only, excuse me, only about 8% of people only codeless yeah. tools. Very interesting. Also, the, uh, about 20% of people saying they haven't done automation before. So that'll be interesting. I'm guessing those folks are looking to, to decide which path to go. All right. Very, very cool. So let's dig into our discussion here. First question is setting the, the ground rules here. How do we differentiate what we call coded tools from codeless tools? We've we put that in our title. We have these two categorizations, and I think it would be helpful for us to really examine how we define each of these. So, Cody, I'm going to turn this question over to you first. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, I've been thinking about this, and I'm really, I'm looking forward to hearing what other people have to say, because um, <clears throat> we haven't talked about it a whole bunch among ourselves uh, until now. Um, but in thinking about it, I, I've realized, I think we pack a lot into it. I think on the surface level, you know, it's, it seems obvious. Oh, it's, you know, do you type uh, a whole bunch of stuff or do you uh, manipulate some other thing? Are you making flow charts or are you uh, <clears throat> dragging stuff around? Um, but as I was, I was noodling over it, I, I realized I think it, there's a couple of different things wrapped up in that. And one is like, how do you create um, your tests, because I think there's, uh, you know, do you stare at a blank page and do you have to start typing, or is there uh, support to, you know, help you get started? Can you record an interaction and then work off of that? Um, so I think there's there's something there. Um, I think there's also embedded in there a question about like how is the test represented? Is it represented in what we think of as co code, some sort of text format um, that we can manipulate and store, 
or is it in some kind of uh, proprietary, you know, maybe a database or, or something you just don't know on the back end. So maybe you're maybe you're typing uh, descriptions of a test, but you don't know kind of what that turns into. You can't embed it into uh, maybe some of your more standard tools like version control and stuff. So I think there's that um, in there. And then that gets into like, once you have tests in whatever tool it is, how do you, how do you get to maintain them and what sort of uh, affordances do you have for, for changing and manipulating those tests? Um, and then finally, I think something that I think you and Anand will be able to talk to in terms of uh, visual testing I think there's also something wrapped up in there about how explicit you have to be about your test. You know, do you have to describe everything about what you want to know and what you want to assert about uh, the system, or or do you get some sort of higher level description that you get to uh, define? Those are some of my initial thoughts, but I, I want to turn it over and hear from some other people. Who wants to jump in? Okay, I, uh, I could go for it. Go Sorry, on. fastest finger yeah. first. Yeah, 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 go for it. <laughs> Polite fight. Yeah. So, um, it's, uh, Cody, you mentioned a lot of very um, nuances or technical details of what the differentiation would be, right? If I have to take a step back, I would probably think about it as, do I need to know anything below the user experience layer or user yeah. interaction model? Right. And if you are just dealing with that layer without knowing the inner mechanics of how the test is going to get recorded and replayed, yeah, there might be some configuration details after the recording is done. But pretty much my scope of influence or interaction is at that UI layer only. Then probably that is code less. If I have to do anything more than that, then there's a fine line of, of, is it hybrid? Is it getting more into coded only type of solution? But that's how I would probably differentiate these. Mush, sorry, yeah, over I, to you. No, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I think, I think uh, Anand, what you mentioned was, was my observation as well. I know Cody was really very, very technical and it blew my mind. I was like, man, that is so precise. And of course, right, he's, He's an engineer, so that's awesome. And and for me, I think what's interesting is I'm actually somewhere in between, I think, what Cody's mentioned and, and what you're talking about, Anand. For me, uh, something that is codeless, right, is, is more about, yes, the user experience of engaging and using a tool to achieve a certain outcome. But then it's also very fascinating for me to, you know, look under the hood a little bit and see how how all of that operates right and you know for me i'm i'm sort of a a fan of cars and and machines right so for me you know i i always look at it as uh, as as something like almost like a on a transmission as an example right yes you know when i'm driving i i know what it's supposed to do how i you know i'm supposed to engage with it and and that experience of of using uh, the mechanics right but then Every now and then, I do want to understand, you know, what happens if and when, and and the way to get into maybe you know peeling the onion back a couple of layers just to get a sense of what's underneath the hood as well uh, helps me get there. So for me, uh, something that is more oriented towards a, a codeless approach is yes, that experience, but having that tie-in to be able to say, here's behind the scene mechanics if you're interested uh, to be able to see that. So that's where I see. You know, my definition of codeless comes in is to say, yeah, I, I get to do all of the fun stuff without having to really worry about all of those detailed mechanics. So that's typically how I have uh, sort of distinguished between how much of heavy lifting, so to speak, I have to do. Cool. Mosh, I love the car analogy because <laughs> recently I've gotten into uh, classic Volkswagens. Uh -huh. I had no choice but to lift up the hood and figure things out. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when I lift up the car hood, I don't understand anything except how clean or dirty the car is. Oh, and that's man. really what it comes down to. And that's what it comes down to the codeless uh, thing as well, right? Having that ability to understand more is very important. 
there is an aspect of being able to do something more once you look at it as well, right? So customizations of sorts, but really it's about uh, trying to understand more how it works, the curiosity to understand how it is working. Uh, and that definitely is a very important factor because if I have to use a tool which is going to generate these uh, very interesting scripts, I don't want to remain over there. I want to try and know more about how it's going to work. So I think that's a very important dimension you added. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and ironically, I, uh, for, for whatever I know about technology on this side, I know nothing about cars. I'm like you and I <laughs> put the key in and, and go. Um, but but I do think uh, there is a lot of value in being able to move from the experience where, that you laid out and on where all you know is sort of the, the surface level user experience to when you need to, how can you, are you able to dig in and, and elaborate on that? Because, you know, what we want to get to, I think a lot of times in automation is taking an experience that uh, we're able to sort of uh, define once and then expand on that. Maybe we want to drive it with uh, like a whole bunch of data to simulate different scenarios. Maybe we want to uh, run it across different uh, environments. And when you can com combine like sort of that ease of just interacting as a user with eventually, you know, elaborating on that, I think that becomes really powerful. Awesome. So I'm going to lift up another question here. How should we decide which types of tools to use in a testing strategy? You know, we just differentiated coded versus codeless, but how do we know what's right, what's wrong, strengths, weaknesses, um, and also even here, like giving examples of each of the different types of tools. Uh, Anand, I'm gonna send this one to you. Okay, so I'm gonna continue with Mush's car analogy over here. I think that's a great uh, thing to go ahead with. So if this is the first question we are asking, what tools should I use in the testing strategy? Then I think we are looking at this wrong you need to understand what really is your purpose. Why are you doing testing? What is the value you're trying to derive from the strategy that you're creating? And in that strategy, there are going to be a, many different aspects. Automation is just one of those aspects when it comes to the testing strategy, okay? So I hope this question, when they're creating a test strategy, which tool should I use? But once you get to the question, the core question about, I've done my due diligence, I understand the vision, how testing needs to happen, uh, what value I'm trying to derive. Now, which tool should I use? I think that uh, becomes very valuable. And for that as well, there are many different aspects that you need to think about before saying what tool is going to work well for me or not. The skill set on the team, the longevity of the project, uh, the product that you're working on, the timelines that you're looking at, uh, the cost aspect as well definitely is an important aspect. But remember, open source or free doesn't necessarily mean it is free for the team, right? There might be no upfront license cost, but there's a lot of other costs as well. So there are a lot of different parameters that you need to think about when you're bringing up a decision, what tool should I use? I'm just going to make one small reference uh, instead of making my answer very long. I have blogged about these criteria for a test automation framework. From an automation perspective, what attributes you need to be considering before saying what tool is going to work well for you or not. That article is available on InfoQ. It is uh, titled uh, uh, Test Automation in the World of AI and ML. I would encourage everyone to take a look at it because it talks about different criteria from automation implementation, execution, and maintenance perspective. Based on the analysis that you do, you should then start narrowing down what tool is going to work well for me or not. Yeah, I I, I couldn't agree more. I think, Anand, you, you hit a, a very important point in that message, right? Which is, you know, us as engineers, we get attracted to the new, you know, buzzword or the new shiny element uh, in our tool set, right? And and I think uh, as difficult as it is to go and play with new tools that come up 
we have to step back and we have to think about that criteria of the you know what is the outcome we really want i think two important parameters i would add in just from a from a decision making criteria right for picking a tool right one of them is i think a lot of emphasis should be made on the team makeup right what is the current you know technical ability what is the what is the uh, cross functionality of the roles that are part of a team uh, i think that should be a pretty important uh, factor in in at least identifying the category of tools you want to use and then the second component of it i think a lot of people also tend to overlook most times is also future scalability right instead of focusing just on the problem at hand which we want to fix which typically you know i i always boil it down to two key criteria right one is how do we get release done faster right and how do we deliver with high confidence those are the two you know baseline solutions everybody's in the hunt for right so when you when you as a as a as a team lead or as a quality engineer get posed that question of saying hey tell us what tool we should be using and then let's just go run for it i think at that point it's very critical to step back look at your team and cross functional expectation but then the second component also is scalability what is it that you want your team to be proud of or have achieved you know anywhere between 6 months to about a couple of years and see if tools and and selections you make will really uh, allow you to scale to that level as as the team matures as as new technologies as as new approaches uh, come in what is that level of flexibility that your tool of choice or tools of choice will give you Yeah, I mean, I think we see repeatedly the importance of considering uh, team structure, and and even thinking even more broadly than like your formal QA team. Who are the people who are going to be engaged in uh, testing and quality uh, in your organization? Because you know we increasingly see uh, people reaching into their uh, business users, business analysts, and having them engage in actually creating. Uh, at least the beginning of uh, tests sometimes. So, you know, those are often people who aren't going to, you know, engage with a, a fully coded tool. Um, they're they're not prepared to jump into an editor, um, and you may want to have something that is more accessible to them. And I love that um, Anand brought up, you know, maintenance um, over, you know, in addition to creation. You also, I think, need to think about like, how long is this. you know application how long is this project going to be uh in place because you you may be looking at years and years of uh you know uh additional testing and refinement and you want to think about like what tools you know give you the leverage that you want to be able to you know adjust to changing uh requirements and and realities on the ground so unfortunately uh, it's one of those things where the answer is complicated and I'm I'm glad I love that I'm glad too that Anand has written something like it. I suspect this is something yeah. that requires a lot more thought. But but a yeah. great answer here. Yeah, a, a lot of these questions actually the answer is very simple, right? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> and there are so many different things to consider before you say what the uh, right answer should be. I just wanted to add two more quick points to this, right? a car will a vehicle will take you from point a to point b the vehicle could be your feet your own feet it could be a bicycle it could be a two wheeler it could be a four wheeler it could be any type of vehicle the speed the cost associated with going from point a to point b these all matter depending on the journey that you are on what is the purpose of that journey so you have to select the strategy the tool sets that help you achieve the purpose of your journey to allow you to get to the speed that you need as well to get to that journey right so uh, that's what uh, i would probably sum up this particular question with it depends <laughs> so we actually have a, a a question from the crowd here oh, um <clears throat> how to decide the best choices or how sorry how to decide the best codeless tool for automation there are so many new codeless tools in the market as from avender preet singh yeah uh i was just pulling that up uh <laughs> and i will 
I, again, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. I would say first go in and kick the tires, try them out. Um, and when you're doing that, I think the thing I would encourage you to consider is how do they scale from the uh, demo uh, prototype that you do to what you imagine or what your real experience is on a project? Because um, I think that's um, where I see the biggest inflection in tools is from the very the ease of starting up to the complexity of uh, scaling up. And one thing when we go back to this whole code list coded uh, question, I think you should think about like, how am I going to uh, elaborate on the base test that I either recorded or typed in English? How do I you know, connect that to test data? How do I connect it to uh, you know, multi-scenario execution? How is that gonna work? Um, and then you know, go back to what we talked about earlier. Do the people who I think are going to be using this tool, are they able to? And, and sometimes that may work in the opposite direction than you're thinking. Like if you have people who are uh, quality engineers and are accustomed to working in a coded environment, are they gonna find it constraining to be in a uh, codeless environment? So again, it, it does kind of depend, but hopefully those are some things you can think about as you go through it. Yeah. Uh, one more thing I would like to add over here, right? Uh, the question also mentioned there's so many options. So how do you narrow down how many you should try out? I think that's what uh, one thing mm -hmm. uh, very critical over there. And what I would again uh, say is look at what are the parameters or the criteria that you require from automation. Do I need to run it in headless mode? Do I need to run it in CI? Or whatever different uh, parallel execution or not, customizations of whatever sorts, once you have your criteria defined what is expected as an outcome, do a quick analysis of the tools that you can find out and figure out which of those can fit those criteria. Narrow it down to a couple of them because it can become an uh, endless exercise if you want to try out everything, right? So narrow down a couple of them, identify a few core use cases, not extremely complex, but medium complex to what Koti was saying, right? Not the demo samples something that is actually important to you as a medium complexity, do a POC with those criteria in mind for the same use case across the tools and see what is going to work best for you. Because you as a team member is the right uh, audience to decide which is going to work best for you. Awesome, awesome. So, how are tools of each type, codeless and codeless, evolving to make up for their weakness? We would hope that as engineers, that we're making the tools that we're using better as we go, that we're not stuck in the past. So, uh, Mush, I'd like to send this one to you first. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and this, is, this is, I think, one of the ones that time and again, we get put into that decision-making dilemma, really, right? And... Uh, I think the the previous discussion that Anand and, and Cody were, were were pointing out, I think, fits right onto this, right? I think if you step back and you think about, hey, what do I classify as a weakness among the two categories of tests, right? I think the extreme examples of that is sort of coming in from the constraint perspective, really, right? Somebody who is more comfortable living in, you know, looking at code and living in an IDE space. Uh, is always thinking about, well, I'll have more control over what I want to do if I'm in on one end of the spectrum there with coded uh, tool sets. The other aspect of it is more business oriented, more uh, uh, workflows, uh, system under tests, expertise kind of uh, mindset where they say, well, I really don't want to get into, you know, identifying what are these different frameworks, what are these different libraries that I need to use and then have to assert and things of that nature, right? Those typically uh, are, are what most people look at, like, hey, is this a weakness, right? And and to me, I think the evolution of each kind is, is actually moving towards sort of like the middle of the road uh, from either end of these spectrums, right? So what I see in a lot of the the, the low code or the, the code lists tools now is uh, they are 
coming closer and and moving towards the ability to actually see under the hood right as we were talking about earlier how is the code written can i tweak them uh, can i actually now reuse what's been created before to actually go and extend other types of tests that i need to do can i actually uh, apply different types of tests right if if you have a tool that is more focused on you know a ui based approach uh, now my architecture requires me to also go into apis uh, to speed up for example uh, we see a lot of tools uh, uh, that are offering that sort of capabilities that way you don't have to you know traverse through a lot of different uh, tools uh, to achieve what the underlying need for your test coverage is uh, so that's one uh, end of the example the other aspect of it uh, when it comes to the the coded tools right i think what we are doing is we are seeing a lot more of integration into into other tools into other less uh, uh, complex so to speak uh, implementation solutions where your tools are now letting your tests be extended and executed in those areas where uh, you don't necessarily have to you know be very very technically strong in order to be able to use it so i, I see you know honestly both sides of the 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 mindsets actually coming towards the the center of the road and and meeting uh, in in a position where it's actually more beneficial uh, for us as the audience uh, and users of of tools on either side of the spectrum what, what do you guys think anand cody yeah well I, I mean i know what i see in the uh, you know code less low code world so to, to document the weaknesses right the weaknesses there are uh can i express things that aren't natively expressed in whatever the sort of low code interface is and i think in all the tools um, you see uh, the addition of some sort of extension mechanism so that you can add functionality add behavior um, you know we've got that in ours i see it in lots of other uh, products in the space um, or sometimes even the, the addition of scripting into the sort of low code or no code environment so that you can, you know, wrap a module that is no code with some script that drives it. Um, one thing that I don't think I see as much of, um, but, but I'd like to see more. And, and if somebody is familiar with this, um, I'd love to hear about it, but is on the coded side, more, uh, support. Yeah, we've got IntelliSense, you, you, you see that, but I'd love to see more support for some of the other context that is required in a uh, in test creation, right? So does it know about, could my environment know about the system under test? So what are all the controls that are available um, and how can I use those and, and have that um, supported within the coded environment? So we do a little bit of that um, in our coded environment uh, where we have an object repository, you can drag and drop stuff into your script with that. But I think there's a lot more opportunity there to support um, support coding, and I think we'll see that come along with uh, you know, advances in ML and the ability of the system to sort of understand the application under test. Okay. So I'm we're actually starting to, yeah, we're actually starting to see that in the the coded world. Um, for one, GitHub Copilot. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's great. That's, a good one. Um, it's it's not there yet, so to speak, but it's getting there, and it's getting a lot yep. of a lot of good attention. I think um, when also, Copilot can see the application under test and your script, then it's going to be mm -hmm. really powerful. Yep. Um, and another thing that's not not as, not so much around context of application, but still coded tools trying to do somewhat codeless things. Um, I know, for example, Playwright they have a code generator where you can yeah. screen record and then it pops out a playwright script that you can then absorb and edit. So there is an interesting overlap happening. Yeah. So, so I'd like to- it already, Chrome now has a code rec a recorder built into it that generates mm -hmm. some stuff too, so. Yep. Uh, There's a lot going on. Yeah. Yep, yep. I just want to add one point. Exports. I was gonna say that one exports Puppeteer, but go ahead and on. Yeah, but so, people um, are, Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I completely agree with you know, what has been said about how tools are trying to make up for the so-called weaknesses, but I just want to throw on a philosophical hat on over here. 
I don't think tools have any weaknesses. They were built as for a particular thought process. And as you see other tools in the space, as you encounter more interesting or different use cases, you evolve to try and implement those. Some tools do it faster, some tools do it better. And you want to try and catch up as well along with them because it sort of makes sense to you for different reasons, right? User base, market share, or whatever reasons might be there. But I just want to say that if I'm building an open source tool, I'm building it with a certain thought process. It's not because of certain strengths or weaknesses. It fits my use case very well. It may or may not for some others. So just wanted to throw out a different yeah. aspect over here. That's that's a great point, Anand. I think evolving gaps is how we should probably look at it, right? Yeah, <laughs> More than different paths, right? I mean, to your point, right? These tools are <clears throat> trying to get to the same places, but they're starting and taking a different path to get there. Yeah, and that's where innovation and creativity also comes in, right? Uh, oh, this tool they added this feature. How can I do something similar but better? So Pravesh Kumar from the audience asks, is it possible to achieve everything with Codeless? Um, is Coded going to even be needed in the future? As long as we can define what is everything, <laughs> probably the answer is yes. But can we really define everything, what everything means? Yeah. That kind of goes I, I back think... to what you just said, right, Anand, where it's, it's a philosophical question. Like, is there such thing as a, a tool having a weakness? I mean, I would take the opposite side and say yes, but whatever. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like what, what is, what is everything? What is it trying to do? Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll take the con a somewhat controversial no. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll say it because we've seen this pattern. We've seen this movie before, at least I have in, in core software development um, where for years and years, like we've been through multiple cycles where people have said, oh, you're never going to have to code again. Now you're just going to, you know, draw pictures of the software you want to build. And what you always run into is there's there's some new edge case that your software has got to push into. Um, and nobody has built the visual framework or the non-coded framework to do that yet because it's mm -hmm. on the edge. Um, so I think my answer is a to backpedal a little bit, it's a qualified no. It's to say, there's always going to be something on the edge where if you're in that space, you're going to need more than codeless. But to you know, Anand's point earlier, you may not be in that space and it may do everything that you need. The codeless tool might be all that you need, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, a plain old hammer does all the, all the work you need around the house, but maybe you know, if you have a new job, you're going to have, I'm now I'm getting into some weird analogy that I'm not even that good at. So, so also, in addition to not knowing about cars, I'm not very handy around the house. <laughs> um, so Cody, are you, are you saying then that, that coded tools will almost always precede codeless tools in terms of? Into a new space, I think up. that is the case. Yeah, I think they, they sort of lead the way if you start going into a new domain. So if you go into Mobile, you'll see coded tools first and then follow up or augmented reality. You're going to see some stuff there first and then you'll move on because who leads into those places? It's usually the engineer who's also making the thing. They're more comfortable in a coded environment, but then somebody has got to come behind them and say, okay, how are we going to make this accessible? How do we put something on top? Yep. Cool. So here's another question for us to discuss. Is there a space between coded and codeless tools where they overlap or interact? Uh, Anand, I'm going to send this one to you. Okay. So I think there has always been an overlap in coded versus codeless. And this is before UI testing came into picture also for that matter. And this is just my, the way I'm looking at it, right? What are the libraries or utilities that we use? We are using it like a codeless solution. I don't want to implement that functionality. I'm just going to use a library that helps me implement the functionality that I need. Keyword-driven frameworks from a UI automation perspective. A very good example of the path in between where once coded, you don't really need to write a lot of code. You are just specifying the keywords, 
the locators, and the implemented code is taking care of the execution side of it. Likewise, in the current uh, day and age, I think AppliTools has a very interesting way of reducing the code that you write. You are writing code or you are recording code using a codeless solution to implement what is required, but the validation aspect, which is much more than what you can really code, that is taken care of automatically by the visual testing aspect, which brings functional and visual validation, the user experience validation automatically uh, to the implementer. So there is definitely always going to be an overlap. Uh, there's an intersection that is going to be there between the coded and the codeless. Even though excellent codeless solutions, they have mechanisms to allow extensions, to allow custom scripting, because one tool cannot solve everything in every use case, right? So you need the ability to do some extensions to provide some more interesting ways that users can solve the problem that they are encountering. So yes, there is space in between and there is definitely a big overlap as well. Yep, I'd, uh, I'd like to throw a slightly different alternative thought in there as well, right? While, you know, I, I agree there's, there's absolutely a lot of overlap as we've seen with so many of the different conversations up until this point, right? I think the one advantage of, of like a good codeless tool or a low code tool that I would think about would be, you know, what are the rails that a tool provides to me as a, you know, new entrant into the quality engineering space or uh, moving from a, from a manual effort to, to using tools? Um, where does, what what guardrails does a good tool give me, right? I think that to me is typically a, an advantage of a, of a low code or a no code tool that, you know, doesn't necessarily come all the times in the coded uh, tool sets, right? Yes, there are tools, you know, that, that give you the, the foundational organization approach, but you know, as a as a as an implementer, then it's up to me to say how closely am I following that, just like any other guidelines or practices of good engineering, right? But I think coded or, or, or code less tools, I think, do have a little bit of an advantage there, where they could come in with an and an recommended approach already built in, where you know, as you pick up the tool, you're not necessarily learning about it on the go, but you actually are implementing without even knowing it. And then as you mature in that process and adopt a, adoption, and as you look under the hood, you then get that pattern out and say, oh, okay, that's where it's using the, you know, the page object model or the screenplay or whatever. So I think that's the other sort of way I think about it as well as a, as a distinct gap between the two. Cody, you have any thoughts here? Oh, I was just concurring with, or kind of agreeing with that. I think the the notion of uh, even in, in either the coded or uh, low code environments, um, thinking about you know the frameworks and the organization, uh, the guardrails, as uh, Mosh put it, I, I think is important. So even I think a lot of low code tools, no code tools, tend to provide that structure because that's that's kind of what the whole game is there, is defining the domain really well and understanding it. But I would say if you're going into a coded you know, tool, do the time to take the time to think about like what, there's usually additional frameworks that people have built around that pure play that will help you organize as you go from demo to POC to like an actual full-fledged project. So. That would be my only comment there. Look around and see what the, the community is doing, what they've built on top of like the pure code. Mm, interesting. Yeah, because I mean, my my thought has always been coded tools give you, the the tester, programmer, developer, whoever you are, more power, right? You, mm -hmm. can, you can define your path, right? You can pick the guardrails you want or not. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I strongly believe in a solid approach with good design patterns, of course. Um, 
and I would call those guardrails. Like I'm very much yeah. a fan of BDD. I'm very much a fan of screenplay pattern, those kinds of That's things, exactly layered architecture. Talking. Yep, yep. But I, I like the ability to have that under my control because I feel like I can tune the knobs and twist and turn as much as I need. I can tune it to be a high performance engine. You know. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. absolutely. I think yeah. I think only one item I'd add there, right, is if if your background allows you to be aware that hey, these are the things I gotta watch for as I begin entering and getting my feet wet in the coded aspect, right? knowing those pitfalls is what will make you actively and proactively really be aware and do it within the guidelines you mentioned, right? But if you're coming from a background that is not necessarily uh, where you've been exposed to that yet, and as a directive, you're trying to say, hey, I know automation is something that will help me uh, at least get rid of some of the mundane repetitive tasks at a minimum. Um, I think there's a, there's a learning curve involved in saying, oh man, I wish we had you know, thought of this sooner. And my thought is maybe there are tools or at least a level of due diligence that should come into that to say, hey, what are those guidelines and rails I should be aware of going in so that way I can mature and really hone it to the way I would want uh, to implement my overall or final solution. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's oh, one uh, point that I would also like to add here. So while codeless makes it uh, very easy, uh, of course, assuming the tool fits the criteria of the product under test and the team, it makes it very easy to implement tests. But at the same time, I also see that as a big risk. The risk being the test automation pyramid. It has now become so easy to automate the tests. I'm going to end up automating even what might not be the right test to have at the top layer of the pyramid. And that is a very big risk to me because now I have implemented the test quickly, but my feedback cycle is getting longer. Right? So that is one aspect that I really wish, uh, I know this is probably not the right topic that we are discussing on, but I think I thought it was very important to mention the space between what Andy was also mentioning as the engineering aspect, the code quality aspect, the guardrails aspect that is there, it is very important to have the intent of the test be extremely clear in the automated test, whether it is coded or codeless. If the intent is not clear, then all you're seeing it, the test as is a set of actions which are going to run in an automated fashion. And that is not really going to help the team evolve. So I strongly believe a good UI automation suit, whether sanity regression, again, words that I wish never existed, but a good UI automation tool makes the intent of the test, the business intent, not the UI actions that you're doing, makes that very explicit. And that is the safeguards that you have if your product is working as expert or not for your users. So I want to stretch this now to the future. What will test automation tool space look like in the next decade? Are we looking at a future of everything being codeless? Are we looking at a future where um, we really occupy that space in between? Is there something yet that we don't know about that we can postulate that might happen? Um, Mush, I'm going to send this one to you first. Sure, sure, and and you know I'm I'm honestly very excited about about this space, right? I think we are right in the in the golden era of uh, test automation, quite honestly, where we are we are getting to play with a lot of different you know philosophies as well as implementation ideas. So this is definitely something that I think there's going to be a lot of change. Uh, I'm also excited by how frequently the term of AI and ML and and quite honestly how loosely it gets used. <laughs> um, but I think I think the way I look at it, what I anticipate and, and I look forward to is I think the the tooling for test automation um, will start focusing on you know adding more visibility. To be honest, in terms of how and what is being tested, uh, 
I think the the reporting structure, um, rather than it being or continuing to be a third party or an integration component, I think is going to move closer towards the actual tool itself and not be reliant on like a third party solution is how I'm thinking about it. Uh, it's going to be where I feel a lot of the different activities that we conduct as part of testing, right? Uh, requirement, accept, acceptability, acceptance criteria definition, how, you know, we we identify or define the scope of the different tests that need to occur, uh, reporting on it uh, in terms of not just the confidence in the quality, but then also looking at opportunities of how we streamline the executions and the environment management more effectively. I think as we look into the next decade, solutions are probably going to come out talking more about how we consolidate and unify that to make it more effective to really allow um, us as, as you know, testers or engineers to focus on the core aspect of us looking at the confidence of quality uh, for our systems under test uh, and not have to worry about all of these other what I consider as overhead tasks uh, as much. I think that's where the automation tooling and the automation solutions that are coming out are probably going to focus a lot on. Uh, and then the other thing I get asked a lot also, which is not really tied to tools, so to speak, but just the the more and more um, usage of the terms AI and ML, um, where the questions get asked is like, hey, is this actually going to replace us as quality engineers or testers? And my short answer to that is absolutely not. I think our roles will evolve to be able to understand and probably tweak those tools slightly differently than what we're used to now. Uh, but it's definitely not going to act as a true replacement. You know, I, I hear autonomous and, and all of those being thrown around a whole lot as well. I think the scope of those words are not what we interpret them to be, which is almost a replacement. It's going to be where it's going to be almost like, you know, what GitHub does, right? Like the co-pilot aspect, that co-pilot emphasis is going to continue through, even if you call it autonomous, you call it AI or ML. That's that's what I think uh, our space, especially from a tooling and automation perspective, is going to, going to go towards. Has anyone seen the movie The Minority Report? Tom <laughs> yes. Cruise, by Tom Cruise. Am I going to get to do this? Is it <laughs> like this? Exactly. So I actually wrote a, a, a post about this back in 2010, uh, thinking about the future of test automation frameworks. And I happened to come, uh, I had seen this movie a little before that time. And also during a similar time, I came across research by Professor John Underkoffler from MIT. He was doing a research based on spatial operating systems, so using gesture-based interactions. And there is already a lot of application of this technology in very niche areas, so whether it's in oil rigs or in you know, very fancy, expensive boutique jewelry stores, whatever, right? Uh, there's a lot of use cases for these already. And I was thinking, how cool would that be if something like that could be used for automation? How can I use gesture-based interactions to build my automation? I'm not just recording the UI interactions, but can I do automation using something even more mind-blowing or different types of interaction? And I think we still have a long way to go. AI ML are probably just the transmission and the oil in the uh, in our vehicle to get us to that stage, we still have a very long and interesting path ahead. Yeah, there's no doubt there's there's a lot to be done. One thing that I've thought of uh, a bunch recently, and, and probably because we've been talking with Apple Tools, um, is I think we'll see test automation, autonomous testing following sort of the path of ML. And if you if you follow ML, you'll know that the place where uh, we really started to see an inflection uh, in machine learning was first in uh, visual processing, um, in, in computer vision. Uh, and then it's now moved on into natural language processing and large language models. So, you know, you see Apple Tools has applied uh, AI ML to vision. 
I think we'll start seeing more and more applied to sort of the language domain within uh, testing so that uh, we maybe have better understanding of the semantics of applications. Um, I think that one interesting place will be uh, starting to understand the actual usage of uh, the application under test in, re in production and being able to feed some of that back into the test system so that if we know that users are starting to take new paths or produce new use cases, um, to let the system actually generate uh, tests from that. And, and then again, to uh, what Mush said earlier, I think the role of the quality engineer will sort of level up um, in terms of you know, uh, adjusting the knobs on the system into where it's looking and what's the priority and where are our risks and, and less about you know, exactly which button and what to fill into a field and sort of creating the environment for testing more than doing the actual testing. But it's hard to say, right? If we look back to 2012, how much of today would we have uh, predicted? So I think there's just going to be, you know, amazing, you know, pro productivity and, and generativity on all fronts. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, awesome. I want to springboard on what you said, Cody. I, I'm a believer that the next wave is autonomous testing. Right where uh, we've, I, I find it ironic that, that in 2022 automation is still very much a manual effort, <laughs> because you have to have somebody develop it, you have to have somebody maintain it, you have to have somebody review it, and so if we can lift that cognitive load off of the the tester, whether mm -hmm. they're a developer, peer tester, whatever business person, then yeah. we're going to spare our whole industry a lot of time and effort. <laughs> and so uh, what I would love to see is, you know, we, we have autonomous verifications with something like Apple tools. I would love to see, you know, autonomous interaction where we have tools that, like you said, can go look at the system, look at it in its context, learn it and um, come up with, or can, can identify appropriate behaviors worth yeah. um, interacting with. And then from that yeah. to almost like, I, I don't think it should just go off and do it. What I would like to see is kind of the Chimera, where you have, um, or the Centaur, wh whichever analogy you want to use, where you have the <laughs> the tool or the, the agent learning from the, the context of the application, learning the behaviors and suggesting that to yeah. humans who can say, ah, I think these would be the best things. And then to say, I basically the human is like, I want this one, this one, uh, those are crap. Let me add a few more and then hit the button and then the tool can say, okay, boom, 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 boom. Yep. That would be. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Th I think that, and, and I, I, I like to think that we can get to a place where a lot of what we're doing is more declarative too, rather than imperative. So we're just, we're sort of setting the stage for what we believe the system needs to do. And then, you know, we can go generate a whole bunch of uh, output. So, all right. What do, what do people think? All right, we've had a very, very busy chat. Um, I do appreciate everyone who did put their questions in the ask a question box. We've got a couple that I, I do wanna bring up um, if our speakers can stay with us for a few moments. Oh, yeah. Um, so Matthew asks, um, I'm interested in your thoughts on how codeless tools fit from a test pyramid perspective. We want to encourage tests written lower down the test stack. Does that require less coding? Discourage this. Um, Anon mentioned something about this, but I think this might be a, a valuable question to uh, for the group. Anon, you want to start? I, okay. Uh, yeah, I could start. See, a, a tool is a tool. It doesn't matter. When you are talking about the test pyramid, the thought process behind the pyramid is have as many tests as are required in the lower layers, which is closer to the actual implementation of the product functionality. On the top layer, you need to ensure it all comes together properly. The user interactions, simulating the user journeys is happening uh, so that your end users, the real users do not get affected if something does not go uh, as expected. So that is what you're trying to do at the top layer of the pyramid. 
Now, depending on the context of, again, the product, the skill set, and all the other parameters, and the great evolution of the tools that have come up in the recent times, you could very easily find a coreless solution, or you could script your own test or extend the coreless tools for specific functionality to implement the top layer of the pyramid. But again, the pyramid is a concept. What defines a pyramid, the ratio between the layers, it's a myth of sorts, right? The right ratio is what uh, your product really uh, needs at that point in time. So a tool will just help you get to the destination. You still have to define what the destination is. Yeah, the one thing I'll say is I think we've been, at least in my mind, I've been thinking about this coded codeless thing a lot at the sort of higher layers of the pyramid, but I, I think there are interesting opportunities. I mean, when you get down into unit testing, it tends to, you know, it tends to be about code, but what I would, I think we, there are examples of this and I think we'll hopefully see more of it where again, there's more opportunities to uh, sort of declaratively define what the requirements are um, at the unit testing layer and maybe have all of that generated um, for you. So I, 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 yeah, I think that's something that we can look for in the coalition environment. Another sort of pyramid thought that I have frequently is that I think to some extent, what you have at what layer also depends sort of on the, the, the sort of system that you've got. And I think increasingly we have systems that are no longer uh, monolithic, but they're like, particularly in big enterprises, they're composed out of many, you know, microservices, sometimes many applications. So, you know, what you're doing in the unit testing layer can't always give you all the certainty that you used to be able to have at the top layers. So you may need to do, you know, more sort of, you know, high level, you know, use case level testing that's crossing some domains to make sure that the system is really doing all you need. And, and I think that's, Anand mentioned earlier that automation can ultimately create a bottleneck because if it's really easy to create automation, you just create more and more scripts. And, and we have a well, whole slide decks on that. Um, but, uh, but I do think we need to realize that we are on a never ending, this is going to sound depressing, a never ending treadmill to some extent, because every time we get new tools, we unlock new capabilities to do more, right? Today, like hardly any system anymore is just a web system or just a mobile system. It's usually got a web interface, an API, a mobile interface. And now you've got to make sure those things are all giving people a consistent experience too across all those things. And soon it's going to be like, make sure my watch also works and that my glasses also work. Um, so back to the 10 years from now, I mean, there is so much we've got to stay on top of. Um, so we, we've got to keep making the tools better. All right. I have another question from uh, Tappen that looks like it might be good for the group. How do you measure the ROI for codeless uh, encoded solutions? Talked about, uh, he asked specifically about um, onboarding speed. Hmm. Yeah, this one I can I can I can start off the conversation, right? I think I think the ROI aspect there's a there's a core baseline probably of four or five categories that come to my mind that people start off with, right? Is probably starting with, you know, how soon do you think you have been able to implement a, a certain level of high or priority test scenarios in your application, right? Um, that's usually one ROI that I see. I think the other important one is uh, how adaptable is it for the different needs of the cross-functional team that you have, right? If you have, you know, a, a very intense uh, or active business user group within the team, I think that becomes another component I typically look at from an ROI perspective. The thing, the third part I usually think about also is the the future scalability right like as we as we talked about as as new tools mature and evolve and it open up abilities to do different things i think that's another roi that i i think about uh to say hey is this going to scale with what i want to be able to test you know six months from now or or i know in our product roadmap 
these are the other areas that we're going to extend into. Am I able to scale up and be able to use this tool to help me test there? And I think finally, the the fourth one really that comes to my mind is, is overall, you know, what is the ultimate sort of cost in me getting to where I want to be in my baseline of a nirvana state, right? Uh, and, and that's sort of like the, I think, a whole different conversation about open source tools versus commercial tools, right? What is that cost associated with me getting to that nirvana stage? So I think at least as a starting point, those are the key ones I, I typically think about uh, when I'm thinking about ROI tools. Uh, I would add a couple of them. Uh, one is how much is my manual regression cycle time reducing because of implementing automation? I'm not saying reducing the human testers, but the repeated testing that humans need to do, how much am I shrinking that time? Okay. Uh, that is one metric that is very important. The second metric is how quickly can I get the feedback of the changes done by developers back to them if everything is okay or there is a problem? So the feedback cycle to the developers before they move on to doing other activities, other development activities, it is important for them to know the impact of the changes that they have done. And I think that's another very important aspect of uh, ROI from automation. Is it really helping get that feedback quickly? And probably the last thing is, in most cases, we have multiple environments before we get to prod. Prod is also a very critical environment where we need to ensure everything is fine on deployment. But the path to production on every deployment in that path to production, how quickly can I get feedback? Is my deployment good or bad? And good not just because deployment is successful, everything is working as per expectations. So these would be key measures, additional measures that I would add as well, where automation again becomes, plays a very crucial role in uh, getting that value. Okay, we have uh, gone past our time. Um, I do. I did want to bring up one uh, thing. Uh, we had several people in the chat ask about how the two products um, with Apple Tools and Catalan work together. Um, and so I wanted to um, give each of us, uh, each of you, a minute to speak about that. Speak about the integration and um, uh, how the uh, future looks for both tools. You are Andy. Why don't you start? Oh. <laughs> sure, sure. So there is a there is an integration between Apple Tools and Catalan. Um, you can install it straight up, boom. Uh, when you're putting in your steps into the Catalan uh, editor, whether you're recording whatever, you can go and edit, and then you can add visual uh, checkpoints using Apple Tools. Yep. And I was going to make a pitch. Uh, Anand and I. Uh, did a webinar last year uh, where we talked about this and we actually demoed it. Um, and uh, we talked too about how the two things work in conjunction because you know there's a lot about uh, verification that you want to do you know purely at the UI layer, but there's also things you want to check sometimes in the DOM layer. Um, and the combination of those two things works together really well. Um, and you know our goal with Catalan Studios to simplify automation and our integration with uh, Apple Tools does that in a number of different ways. We make it easy to use Apple Tools. Apple Tools makes it easy to do broad verification across an, an, a sort of entire application, sort of the visual experience there. So yeah, you can you can go dig it up out of the archives. I like to think it was a pretty good webinar, mostly because Anand was on. We can uh, we can include that in the follow up email. Um, yeah, so like I said, we are have run over our time. I did want to. Each one of the companies had a few resources uh, for the audience to bring up. Um, there are on the left side of your screen links to request a demo if you'd like to see either one of the products to learn more about either one of the products. Um, here are some links that Apple Tools would like to share. Um, again, free account, um, an, up an event we have next week, and uh, Test Automation University. It's a free learning um, resource that we uh, provide. Likewise, Catalan has a free account as well. Um, here is a link to that. 
um, where you can get that and uh, request a demo and learn more about their product as well. Um, any other last minute comments from the group? Just thanks everybody for the conversation. Yep. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Absolutely. This was fun. Absolutely. This was a great discussion. We do ask that you um, complete the survey. There's a check mark on the toolbar at the end of your screen. Provide your feedback. Let us know what you think. We are we love to do these things and we love to work with our partners. So we want to hear what uh, what your key takeaways were. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Be looking for an email uh, by the end of the business day tomorrow with a link to the recording into the asset. Thank you.